Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's class. My name is Bill Lester. I'm with University of Florida IFAS Extension Service in Hernando County, Florida. And today we're going to be talking about diagnosing plant problems, and this is going to be part two. So let me go ahead and open up my presentation here. And there we go. Hopefully everybody can see that okay. Like I mentioned earlier, if you have any questions during the presentation, just go ahead and put them in the chat box. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there's a little box that says chat. Go ahead and click on that and put your questions in. And I'll go ahead and go through all the questions and answer them at the very end. So today we're talking about diagnosing plant problems. And this is part two of a two-part series. Part one, we talked about all the different possible problems that you could encounter in your landscape. And that's for flowers and landscape plants, vegetable garden, trees, lawns, whatever it may be. This kind of covers everything that may be growing on your property. And today is gonna to be part two. We're gonna look at all those different areas a little bit deeper and share with you about how to go about getting an accurate diagnosis about what exactly is wrong with your plant. So I'm going to try to share a lot of tips and tricks and cover things that we see the most often in our office and the kind of questions that I get day in and day out most commonly. So from part one, why is this important? Why are we focusing on this? Because you can't fix a problem if you don't know what the problem is. And I speak to people literally every day who call and they say they have a problem with their lawn, with their hedges, with a tree or a plant. And they say, I have a problem with it and I watered it more and I put down more fertilizer and I sprayed it with an insecticide before I even know exactly what the problem was because that's what you do when your plant has a problem, right? Well, that's not right. You need to figure out exactly what the problem is, and then do a little research, do a little investigation, or contact us for the best way to deal with that problem and hopefully cure it. And there's a lot of really negative impacts from a wrong diagnosis or just a total lack of diagnosis. So obviously when these people that we speak with go out there and water more, they're wasting water, if they go out and put down fertilizer, a lot of times that's not the cure for the problem. So now they're putting more fertilizer in the environment that's going to find its way into our groundwater. If they go out there and spray with whatever insecticide they have in their shed, maybe it's going to work, maybe it's not going to work. So a lot of times that just results in a lot more chemicals in the environment, and we don't want to see any of that. And if you make the wrong diagnosis or just completely skip the diagnosis part, what you usually end up with is possibly dead plants because the problem that your plant or lawn or tree has is just going to get worse as you're taking the wrong steps to try to fix it. Ends up in a lot of wasted time and effort. Like I said, unnecessary chemicals and fertilizers in the environment, a waste of water. So it's really important that if you have a problem, you kind of stop, look at it logically, so the first step is going to be diagnosis, figure out what the problem is, and then take the steps that are going to actually cure it. So as we covered in part one, there's a lot of abiotic problems could impact your plants. Abiotic means it's caused by something that's not alive. So this could be caused by the weather is either too hot or too cold. And let me go ahead and mention the cold weather that we've had recently, if you have never experienced cold weather here in Central Florida, let's say you're very new to the area, it got pretty cold this past weekend. So if you live up in North Florida, it got very cold up there. Even South Florida got unusually cold. It can happen. We have cold weather sometimes that's a whole lot colder than what we experienced just a few days ago. So if you're growing plants to your yard that are maybe not very well suited for your part of Florida, that's going to be a problem. Trying to grow tropical fruits and bananas and papayas here in Central Florida or North Florida, if it gets really cold, you're going to have to keep them warm and protect them. I know a lot of people were very surprised because they went out and covered their plants and they still suffered a lot of damage. 
So covering your plants helps. It keeps them a couple degrees warmer, but not a lot warmer. So if you're growing things outdoors that are very tropical and you cover them, it's only going to give them a couple degrees protection. So it may still get so cold that it causes serious damage or completely kills your plant. So being adventurous and growing things out of place, things that maybe grow great down in Miami and Homestead, growing them here in Central Florida can still be a problem and they can still die even if you do cover them. If you did experience a lot of damage to your plants from the cold weather, the best thing to do right now is just wait and be patient. Keep them watered. If it gets really dry, if they need watering, follow just normal irrigation. You don't have to fertilize them. You don't have to spray them with anything. None of that's going to help. The only thing that's going to help is time. Wait and see, and you'll eventually see in a month or two, definitely by the middle of March, whether the plant is completely dead or just damaged and has to be pruned back. So what you're going to do is here in Central Florida, generally by March 1st to March 15th, you're safe to go out there and prune off all the dead, frozen plant material that's still on your plants. And if they're starting to grow back, you're just going to have to cut them back and let them grow back this summer. At that point, if the plants are completely dead, you'll be able to tell that. One thing you could do is look at the stem and scrape it with your thumbnail. And if the plant is still alive, it's going to be green underneath the bark. If it's completely dead, it's brown and possibly mushy underneath the bark. So by March 15, it's going to be pretty obvious whether your plant is just badly damaged and needs to be cut back or it's completely dead and needs to be replaced. And that happens every winter, especially when we get a really bad cold front. So some other abiotic problems that you could have is you have your plant in a spot and it's just too wet or too dry. If uh, your plant's growing in a very sandy, dry area, it may need extra irrigation when we don't get rain. For people who have a wet yard or a wet spot or corner in your yard, if you put a plant there that doesn't like a lot of extra moisture or standing water, it's probably gonna develop a root rot problem and eventually either have problems or totally die. So a lot of that goes back to putting the right plant in the right place. There are plenty of plants that enjoy growing in wet areas that you could pick from if you do have a wet spot, but there's a lot of plants that hate wet feet. So if you put them in a wet area and then we have a very rainy, long summer and the roots and the plants stay wet too often for too long, it's gonna eventually cause a lot of problems. The plant's gonna suffer. Some of this goes back to not realizing that you live in Florida. There's certain things that are gonna grow very well here, but other things that maybe grew well in a different state that you moved here from that are not gonna do well here. My favorite one to pick on is lavender. People love to try to grow lavender here in Florida and it almost never works out well. A few people grow it and it grows okay in the winter. Once we start to get in the summer and it gets really warm and humid and steamy, your lavender will have a lot of disease problems and will usually die pretty quickly. So it grows great up north, but not so well here in Florida. And like I said, a lot of this just goes back to the basic, doing a little research, a little homework, and figuring out the right place to put that plant that you want to grow in your yard. So a couple of different symptoms and cures for those kind of problems. If your plant's wilting, if it's just failing to perform, it may not be in the right spot. And I have a perfect example. I spoke with a gentleman a few weeks ago who had had a landscaper install an entire hedge of azaleas in his backyard. And he was wondering why a couple of them had died and the rest of them look terrible. They're wilting, they're not growing, they're not thriving, they're not doing well. The problem is he put a whole row of azaleas out in the full sun in his backyard. And I have no idea what his soil pH is. He didn't know either because he hadn't checked, but his pH is probably naturally pretty high. So if you look up information on azaleas, you'll learn that they need to grow in partial shade so they seem to do the best underneath an oak tree where they get that speckled sunlight during the day. Not direct sun, not total darkness, but somewhere in between. And they require a very acidic soil to grow in. So 
I had to give him the bad news that his azaleas would probably never thrive and do well in that spot because he put the right plant in the wrong place and probably in the wrong soil also. So it really helps if you check and go out there and look how much sun or shade is that spot going to get? How much moisture does it get? Do you have a very sandy yard in Spring Hill? Or do you have a wetter, uh, maybe swampy yard that holds the water a lot more in downtown Brooksville? And then check the soil pH also. And then learn what your specific plant needs. It may be a very fussy plant. Some plants, a um, couple examples are palm trees. Very, very important that you get a quality palm tree fertilizer and you fertilize with that because your palm trees suffer from a lot of nutrient deficiencies. Same thing with citrus. Other plants are going to be difficult to grow here. They're going to be fussier about their exact conditions. Other plants, it seems like you can plant them anywhere in any yard and they're going to take off and they're going to do great. Probably the best example of that is one that I have on my backyard, firebush. Seems like you can plant them most anywhere. They're going to grow like a weed for most of the year. When we get a really bad freeze, they will freeze all the way back to maybe the bottom foot or so. In the spring, cut them all the way back. They're going to grow back very quickly, flower, very, very dependable plants. So you're going to have to do a little homework on exactly what your plant needs and how fussy or forgiving it is. So biotic factors, different things that can affect your plants adversely that are alive. And we covered in part one, a little bit about animals. The, all depending on where you live, you may have no animal problems. If you live way out in the country, you may have problems with every animal imaginable because we have a lot that live here. If you live out in the country, you may have anything from deer to rabbits to raccoons to possums to voles. Um, voles are little animals that are not moles. They don't bury, they don't make burrows and tunnels in the ground. They live above ground. But if you have them in your yard, they can eat your plants also. So with animals, there's really no easy solution exclusion is going to work best so you're going to have to put up some kind of fencing depending on the animal you're dealing with for deer that can be very difficult deer are large they can jump over fences pretty easily you may have to invest in a very very large fence to keep the deer out um when you think that when you don't know what your problem is i don't know if it's a fungus i don't know if it's an insect i don't know if it's an animal look closely at what kind of um, damage you're having a lady sent me a picture of her strawberries the other day, and I couldn't really tell from the picture, but like half of each strawberry was gone. And I couldn't tell from the picture whether something had eaten it or whether she had a fungus or a rot, and now half of the strawberry had rotted off. So if you look at your strawberries and half of each strawberry is gone and it's just been bitten off and there's teeth marks, I would suspect some kind of animal. And all animals like strawberries. That could be anything from a deer to a rabbit to a raccoon that's eating your uh, plants. So that's, what you, that's where you wanna start looking and thinking about if you have an animal problem or not. And if you need to take steps to help protect your plants from those animals. Insects, we do have plenty of insects here in Florida. I think the last I heard was about 12,000 different species of insects here and they can cause a lot of damage to plants and in your garden. So it really helps if you take a very, very close look at your plant and what kind of damage is suffering, that's going to help you narrow down the possible suspects that could be feeding on your plants. And the best way to do that is by looking at the feeding damage. So if you have a hibiscus growing in your backyard and you walk out there one day and half your hibiscus bush is gone. The branches have been chewed off or clipped off and they're gone. It's just absolutely missing. What that probably is is a deer because deers love hibiscus. It's, hibiscus is like crack to a deer. They, that's, if they come in your yard, that's the first thing they're gonna look to feed on. If you look at the leaves and your leaves are chewed up and half of each leaf is missing, what that could be is an insect with a chewing mouth part. 
And that would be things like caterpillars, grasshoppers, and it actually chewed the leaf up and now half of each leaf is missing. If you look at your hibiscus and the growing tips are wilting and kind of hanging down, they're yellow, they're discolored. What that could be is a very small insect, something like an aphid, a mealybug, a scale, that what it's doing is it's piercing into the plant and sucking the juices and the nutrients and the chlorophyll out of it. So a lot of times you can look at the damage and based on the damage, kind of come up with a short list of the possible suspects that are causing that damage. And then what you need to do is look very, very closely. A lot of these insects can be very small. So you're gonna to have to get a magnifying glass or a hand lens and go out there and get up close and personal and look very, very closely. Because if you contact me and you say, my hibiscus looks bad, so I sprayed it with an insecticide, first thing I'm gonna ask you is why? <laughs> Did you see an insect? What does the insect look like? What kind of insect is it? And if you say, I don't know, I didn't look, I didn't see insects, I don't know if I have an insect or not. I just sprayed it because I thought maybe it had insects. Once again, I'm gonna ask you, why did you do that? If you can't bring it into the office and drop it in my hand, even if it's really, really small and I might have to put it under a microscope to look at it and identify it, then it's an imaginary insect. And we have no recommendations on how to control imaginary insects. So if you have an insect problem, you will be able to see it it might be very small, but if you bring it to me, I can look at it under a microscope and I can see it and I can let you look at it and I can show you that, oh, this is an aphid, this is a mealybug, this is a spider mite. And now I know what it is and I can tell you exactly what to do to get rid of it and help control it. So diseases and diseases can be very, very complicated to identify exactly to the species what the disease is, but we can get an idea. And a lot of times you don't even need to know what the species is. You just need to know whether it's a fungus, a bacteria or a virus. So a lot of times, once again, with very careful observation, you can narrow down what your problem is and whether it's a disease and what kind of disease it is just by looking very, very closely and looking at the signs and the symptoms. So the signs are gonna be the actual part of the organism. So a lot of times a plant, if it has a disease, it's gonna have dark spots on the leaf. It might have a white furry substance growing on the leaves. And if you look very, very closely, and this almost always requires a magnifying glass or a hand lens or what we use as a microscope to get a good look at it, a sign is going to be the actual organism that's attacking your plant. The symptoms are going to be what your plant is doing in response to that. So a symptom is going to be wilting or the plant is dying or the plant is turning yellow or the leaves are falling off. That's what the plant is doing in response to the disease. So generally homeowners most commonly are gonna deal with a fungus that causes some kind of spots or some kind of damage on the leaves, which we call a leaf spot. If you have a lot of spots, we call it a blight. A blight is more of a really, really advanced leaf spot. Or there's a lot of fungi that just naturally live in the soil. And if your plant is growing in a spot where either you keep it too wet or it rains a lot during the summer and the rain is keeping it too wet, or we had a hurricane or a tropical storm and your yard flooded and now your plant or tree is sitting in standing water, that's going to cause a root rot. So the fungus that normally lives in the soil and normally doesn't cause any problems if you have your plant growing basically in mud for too long, all of a sudden the roots are going to get damaged and it's going to let that fungus into the roots and the fungus is now going to attack the roots and damage the roots and your plant is going to show a lot of damage because of that and probably die from it. So a lot of times it really helps to once again do a little um, homework and background investigation to find out if your plant that you're trying to grow 
is a fussy plant that has a lot of disease problems or is a very easy to grow plant that has almost no disease problems. And this varies. I sat there and thought about the ones that we see the most often at the office, and a few of them are roses. If you try growing roses here in Central Florida, you can grow some varieties pretty easily, the um, rambling roses or cracker roses, the ones that are native or just are naturalized to the Southeast US, they grow very well. They have a few problems, but not too many. And those are the ones that get very large and they spread and they flop over. They get a lot of flowers on them, but they tend to be very small flowers. If you try growing the beautiful named David Austin roses that you order from a catalog and grow, they are just gonna have all kinds of disease problems. You're gonna be spraying a fungicide on them a lot to be able to grow them here. And chances are they're gonna die from some kind of root rot or some kind of disease on average after about four years. So up north, they grow very well and they will grow for years and years for generations. You may up, in, up, in the, up north have your grandmother's rose that she grew and is still growing. Here in Florida, they just don't do that well. Too much disease pressure during the summer when it gets really hot and wet. Indian hawthorn is a very common landscape bush and it always gets fungal leaf spot every summer. Landscapers stopped using this when they're building new houses a couple of years ago because it has so many problems. If you really want an Indian hawthorn, they do have varieties now, new varieties that are disease resistant you could try, but the older ones always get leaf spots and problems. St. Augustine turf grass, we see a lot of problems with that in certain areas, if you have a very, very sandy soil, if you don't manage it correctly, meaning that either you or your lawn service cuts it too short, you can get a fungal disease called take all root rot and it will kill your lawn. And you need to learn how to deal with that correctly because if you think that you can go out there and just water your grass and fertilize it more and that's gonna fix it, that will not. The disease will spread and spread and probably kill your entire lawn. So as long as you keep not managing it correctly, you can replace that lawn over and over again. It will, after one to three years, it will get the disease again and will die again. And we see people who have replaced their lawn several times and spent thousands of dollars on it, thinking that if I water it and fertilize it and treat for chinch bugs, that's gonna fix the problem. It does not fix the problem. So doing a little background homework to figure out, is this a fussy plant? Is it an easy plant? Goes a long way to helping to figure out what your disease problem actually is. So if you have a plant and it has spots on leaves, that could be one of a couple different things. If it's a fungus, it's going to look possibly like the picture on the left here. So this is a blade of St. Augustine grass, and this is a very, very common disease that breaks out in the summer called gray leaf spot. And if you look at your lawn really close and pick the grass blades and look at them very close, you're gonna see little spots like this. If you put that under a microscope and look at those spots very closely, what you're gonna see is on the surface of the leaf, little things growing out of the leaf and that's the actual fungus. And it's making spores and it's growing mycelium and the spores are maturing and blowing in the wind and moving around with rain when it rains and moving the spores to healthy blades of grass and the disease is spreading and spreading and spreading. The picture on the right here is a very, very common disease, alternaria on a leaf. So once again, if you look at that spot closely and it's a fungus, you're probably gonna see things on the surface that are growing out of it that is that actual fungus. Something else that it could be is herbicide damage. And we see this quite a bit. And this sometimes can be a little difficult to actually get information from people on. So what happens is people will call us or send a picture and they say, I have plants in my front flower bed and they have little brown and black spots on them. What is it? And we're thinking, well, that could be a disease. It could be overspray from an herbicide or weed killer. So we ask them, did you spray a weed killer either on your lawn or in the flower bed recently? They say, nope, I didn't do that. Okay, well, 
do, do you have a lawn service or anybody else that could have sprayed it? Yeah, but I don't think they sprayed anything. I said, okay, well, did they spray or do anything to control the weeds in your front flower bed? And they said, well, I think my, my lawn guy sprayed something to kill the weeds out there a few weeks ago. Aha, that could be it. Because if you're out there spraying an herbicide on a weed in a flower bed or in your lawn to control that weed, and there is a very, very slight breeze, if you're spraying it, it only takes a tiny bit of breeze to move the tiny droplets of that spray a couple feet, and now they're going to land on your azalea, your hibiscus, your um, landscape plant, your Indian hawthorn, also in the flower bed. And that little bit of overspray is going to cause little dots and spots on the leaves that if, it's, if it only got a tiny bit of, of overspray, it'll grow out of it. It's not going to kill the plant. If it got a lot of spray on it, it could kill the plant. So it depends on how much overspray it got. But when we look at those leaves under a microscope very carefully, we see the leaf and we see the black spot on it, but there's nothing on the surface and nothing growing out of it like you see on the picture on the right-hand side here. So if I look at the right-hand side picture, because I see things growing out of the surface of the leaf, I know that's probably a fungus, but if I looked at that leaf and all I saw was just black discoloration on it, but no damage to the surface of the leaf, that could be herbicide overspray. So these are all the different things that we look at when trying to track down and diagnose a problem. And these are things that you could actually look at and you can see with a good magnifying glass or a hand lens. If you are interested in a hand lens, you can buy them on Amazon for just a few bucks each. If you look up Jewelers Loop, L-O-U-P-E, or just a loop, L-O-U-P-E, or hand lens, you can find plenty to pick from. And all you need is like uh, it to magnify 10 times, 10x or 20x, and that's enough to actually see what you're looking at on the right-hand side here. So a couple of tips and tricks with trying to figure out, is my problem a fungus? Is it a bacteria? What is it? Fungi are generally fairly dry. So if you get spots on your leaves, you look at them and it's fairly dry. It's not, you know, really um, wet and decayed. It's probably a fungus. Bacterial problems are very commonly wet and stinky. So you will see a lot of bacterial problems. A lot of times they're post-harvest problems. So if you, have a, if you have a vegetable garden and you have problems with your fruit rotting outside, and what happens is the tomato or cucumber or watermelon, whatever it might be, gets a spot and the spot grows. And now it's really wet and breaking down. And you, know, you notice a really bad odor from it. That's probably a bacteria. And keep in mind that different types of fungi can attack the leaves. We call that usually a leaf spot. It can cause uh, damage to the trunks and the stems. We call that a canker and also the roots. And we would call that a root rot. So these are all um, caused by fungi a lot of times totally different species and types of fungi, but they can attack at one point or another every different part of your plant. Something that helps a lot towards controlling these long-term is good sanitation. So good sanitation is gonna reduce the amount of inoculum out there in your garden. And that is your vocabulary word for today. Inoculum is the uh, fungal spores and the fungal parts that you leave sitting out in your garden. So if you have a plant that starts to get a lot of spots on the leaves, the leaves fall off, pick all those leaves up very carefully and throw them in the trash. Because the leaf that has spots on it that is now laying in your garden is covered with fungal spores. And when it rains, the rain is gonna splash those spores back up on your plant and you're gonna get more and more disease. By following good sanitation and cleaning up those leaves, cleaning up those dead plants and disposing of them promptly and completely don't compost them because the fungal spores a lot of times will survive in the compost. When you put the compost back in your garden, you're putting in compost, which is good, but you're putting back disease spores, which is very, very bad. So take the disease plants, dead plants, 
dead leaves and throw them in the trash and get rid of them promptly. And it's going to help reduce the amount of stuff out there in your garden that's going to spread. And also very important, don't go outside and blame the first thing that you see in your yard for your problems. I had a lady call me once before and she said, what do I do to get rid of those great big grasshoppers that are destroying my lawn? And I thought, that's probably lover grasshoppers because they're very, very large and very, very noticeable. You don't have to look too far and hard to see them. By the end of summer, they get about two inches long, but they don't damage lawns. So I said, what kind of lawn do you have? She said, I have Bahia grass. Okay, why do you think the grasshoppers are damaged again? She said, I walked outside this morning and my lawn looks terrible. It looks brown. I have a lot of weeds. It just doesn't look good. And I turned around and I saw grasshoppers on my bushes. So what do I do to get rid of the grasshoppers? I said, well, the problem is your lawn probably has problems, but it's probably not the grasshoppers that are causing that problem. We need to look a little deeper at what is actually going on with your lawn to figure out what the problem is and what you could do to have a better looking lawn. But it's probably not the grasshoppers that you turned around and it was the first thing that you saw in the yard that's causing the problem. So sometimes your actual problem isn't really obvious. You're going to have to look beyond the first thing that you see out in your yard. So a little bit of learning goes a long way towards helping to diagnose all the specific problems that you may have with your trees, your vegetable garden, your lawn, your ornamentals up on the flower bed. So we do have lots of these classes and pretty much all of them we save and record to be able to use afterwards. So the easiest way to follow all of our upcoming classes is if you go to Hernando Extension, all one word, dot com, and you can see that in the picture in the upper right hand corner. That's what it looks like. That is just a full listing of all of our upcoming classes. And whether they're on Facebook Live or Zoom or some other kind of platform, uh, the links, the registration information, the days, the times, all the information that you're going to need to be able to tune in and join all of our classes. And with that, that is all of my contact information. Let me go ahead and get out of screen sharing there so that I can check all of our questions. And we have a question here about, I missed part one. Is there any way I can get a recording of it or the presentation? So if you need a link to part one, just go ahead and shoot me an email. But otherwise, if you look on our Facebook page, we take the classes and after a day or two, once the um, video is finalized and cleaned up, we put it back on Facebook. We do have a YouTube site. If you go to Hernando County Government on YouTube, they have all of our videos on there. Lily has her own playlist. I have my own playlist for Hernando County Extension and all of our classes are back either on hers or online. It depends on who ran it and who recorded it. So we do have that. So Caitlin, go ahead and shoot me an email and I'll send you a link to part one so you can watch it. And Eileen asks, is it harmful to cut off frost damage now? I know you said to wait until March. Technically, it is not harmful to cut it off right now. The problem is if we get another freeze in two weeks and we very well may get that, Maybe we won't get any more freezes. Maybe it'll warm up and we'll just have a beautiful remainder of winter and a beautiful spring. If you cut it, what happens is the freeze damage, those dead branches, the dead leaves help to insulate the rest of the plant, the interior part of the trunk and the roots. So if we get another freeze in two weeks, that dead part is helping to insulate the rest of the plant. So you really wanna keep it on there for insulation. And as soon as you prune the dead branches of foliage off a plant, what you do is you stimulate it to start growing. So if you go out there and prune the brown branches and leaves off today, in a week, you're probably going to have some new growth on that plant. And the new growth is very, very tender and sensitive to freezing. 
So if a week after that, we have another major freeze where it gets down into below freezing or the upper 20s, now your plant may freeze to the point where it totally dies. So it's really best from a plant health perspective to leave the dead stuff on there. I know it doesn't look very attractive. Maybe your HOA is gonna start to get a little twitchy about it also, your neighbors, but, but from a plant health perspective, it's a lot better to keep that dead stuff on to insulate it and not promote new growth until you want that to happen. And as a general rule, March 15th, we tell people that it's safe to do it then. Don't take that as an absolute. I've seen really serious freezes here in Central Florida in the Orlando area up until April 1st. So it can happen, doesn't happen very often, but it can happen. So if, you're, if you want accurate weather forecasts, don't ask me, I can't give it to you. I could just give you general guidelines. And it's a general rule. If you do it in the middle of March, you're generally safe.